So welcome home to Tall Poppy, the home for inspiring upstarts and thriving upstarts. And today we are visiting with Steve Parmalee of Fitch Even, a intellectual property law firm out of Chicago. And today we're talking about Patent Searching 101. Welcome back, Steve. Glad to be here. So, guide us. Well, Patent Searching 101, uh, for those who are steeped in patent lore, the 101 is unfortunate because that actually signals an entirely different problem set. So let me say right from the outset, we're not talking about that if you know what I'm talking about. If you don't know what I'm talking about, it just is a suggestion that this is kind of a basic presentation. If this were college, this would be your entry level uh, course for this particular topic. And we are talking about patent searching today. Uh, we've got our usual uh, predicate here that uh, this isn't legal advice. If you do need legal advice, please find a uh, appropriate legal counselor, a licensed patent attorney or agent, for example. And uh, to the extent uh, you hear any opinions being offered during this presentation, uh, I may change my mind for any number of reasons uh, at any point in time, so don't hold me to any of this. So. What we're gonna talk about in this presentation is why search at all, uh, professional searching uh, as something that's out there and available, some searching resources, uh, and by that I mean your own sweat equity and uh, that's basically free in terms of out of pocket. Uh, we'll look at a simple searching example to try and show you how some of this works and a conclusion of sorts. So why search? Uh, first of all, what we're talking about searching are issued patents and pending patent applications. Since many countries have a patent system, uh, many of those have a, 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 a database or a repository, public or private, whereby you can get access to that content. And uh, most of that's online these days. Um, it wasn't that long ago when to do a patent search, I would get on a plane, fly to Washington, D.C., to the patent office, get my pass, go into an enormous room full of paper, and uh, you would find by key words the, the drawers of materials that were relevant to what you wanted, and you pulled open the drawer, and there were patents on bristleboard, kind of stiff, and you could sort of flip, 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 and you see something you wanted, then you could get a copy of it. Uh, that's the way business was done, but as things have gotten online, um, that is still an option. If you actually have a uncertain vacation plans and you'd like to go do that, you can. But um, you can also do it from the convenience of your computer, your laptop, your a tablet, your phone. So uh, to, to clarify, um, that if someone has put in a patent and a patent application, so if it's a provisional patent, that is disclosed for you to search? I, if, I think your question is, uh, there are different things we've talked about, provisional patent applications, there's actual patent applications like a utility, they issue as a patent. Um, so not all of that is necessarily immediately available. Uh, once a patent issues, that is published as a separate event and that no matter what else has happened, is available to the public. And in the U.S., there's over 11 million issued patents. So I have a question from that. Um, if, you, if it's not disclosed, how then you, can you uh, contend it that if you think that someone shouldn't get a patent? Well, so um, just as the U.S. issues patents, if uh, Great Britain issues a patent or the European Patent Office issues a patent or Japan issues a patent, those get published. So issued is definitely available. When you file a patent application, not provisional, we're not talking that, we're talking about filing a utility patent application. Most patent systems publish at the 18-month point from your earliest filing date. Um, in the U.S., there is an option that you can check the box if you're the applicant, and if you are not filing in another country. You're only going to stay in the U.S. You can say, please keep my application secret. And in that case, it won't publish. And it won't publish until it actually issues or it dies, in which case it'll never see the light of day. 
if it never sees the light of day, you were just asking, well, what about my application as prior art to prevent someone else from getting an application? Uh, if it doesn't publish, it won't have that effect. It needs to be published, at least in the patent system. You could do something yourself to publish it. You know, but if you are looking at the patent system to do that for you, it needs to be published, either as an application and or eventually as an actual patent. Provisionals don't get published unless you file a regular patent application that claims benefit of them. And then at that point, you have access to them as the public. So there's some kind of ifs, some dominoes get set up and yes. they don't fall down until something happens to make them. So the, uh, in that period of time when you've got that unpublished, you could have two patent applications in um, that might cross. True, although the patent office, at least the U.S. patent office, does have some intentional procedures internally to try to spot that. And um, if they become aware that, yes, two people are claiming the same thing, uh, okay, they might get them to the same examiner or otherwise keep an eye on them so that when the one publishes, the earlier one publishes, now that can be used as prior art against the later filed one and just be applied. So the one might proceed to issuance or not. The other one may just hit a brick wall formed by So the, the first, first to patent, the first to file, should Always win, comes. presuming everything else is equal. Right. First to file should win. This is law. There's asterisks. There are circumstances when you might be able to demonstrate certain facts that would get you to a different result. With all these patents and patent applications, there are millions of documents uh, in just this patent literature that many people just they, they do a Google search on, oh, I'm going to, you know, I had this invention for a new birdhouse. They put birdhouse into Google and they, they look at things. They find websites. They find things on Etsy. And they think they've got an idea about how, you know, what's out there in the world. The fact is there's an awful lot of ideas, good, bad, and in between, that have been patented or the subject of a patent application that never saw the commercial world for any number of reasons. And in terms of assessing your own for example, patentability of an idea I have, if you ignore that body of knowledge, you've absolutely not even done half a job yet. Is it a good start, though, to do that? Oh, you mean the other thing I just said? Googling and... Sure, if you're familiar with that and you just fiddle around on Google for 15 minutes and discover that this new idea you have is for sale on Etsy for $15 or whatever, well, you just learn something. Um, sure, that's appropriate. Um, I don't have a problem with that at all. But whether you do patent searching first, second, third, um, or it, it in different roles with or different kinds of positions, a startup or an individual or whatever, um, just too many people don't have access to this information. And this presentation really is about trying to access that. This is a resource, guys. And the second point, uh, if a patent is expired or the published patent never issued, it went abandoned, that's public domain. And that idea is now available. You can take it and do it. You can take it and improve it. If you improve it, you may need to search the improvement uh, to make sure that's not patented. But the point being, uh, if your real goal is, I want to be in business doing X, that doesn't mean you necessarily have to invent X from the ground up. If you find out it's there and available for free, that's kind of interesting. Another thing that's actually not here, um, well, actually it is here, so let's get to it. So you can be doing searching to assess patentability. You can at least look at the question, is this new? As in, is this identical to what I want to do? Slap in the face, but awfully good to discover if you, you are early on. Non-obviousness, we've discussed that a bit in the past, really, really uh, difficult test uh, and for the layperson an impossible test because the words don't mean at all what you think they mean. So, uh, but it certainly can get grist that uh, if you start to feel funny or you just want to know, you can go to your patent practitioner and you know you walk in the door with a very framed question and the legal services you're going to pay for 
and get is much more contained and focused, which is a good thing. Um, you can use the results of the search to do some assessing of risk. If you find a, a, an issued patent still alive and it looks like what I want to do, um, that's perhaps an infringement question. Is this trouble waiting for me if I try to do this as a business? To a, identify possible acquisitions, you may find that there's a patent and it's issued and it's doing exactly what you want, but hey, that might be an opportunity. Go buy that patent or license it and you're in business without even having to go through turning the crank on getting your own. It saves a lot of money in that regard because well, it information on the price. <laughs> of that's so true. But, but it saves time potentially. It saves risk. As you said, it's a risk assessment. And there's that as well. And yet another reason why searching can be useful is to identify subject matter experts. Um, you may be looking to do a particular thing. You're not quite certain how to do it. You do some patent searching because you know what it is you're looking for. You're just not skilled in it. And you may discover that I like what I'm seeing. It's not quite right for me. But the person who did it may be an individual, not in a company. Um, and it may be that hey, I'll just contact them. This person appears to know a lot about something I'm interested in and we can work out some kind of an arrangement where um, you, oh, I can get this thing that I need and, uh, and again, find very targeted, appropriate assistance. Um, these are just some of the reasons why it can be useful. Um, so you actually could be resource gathering. Yes, and in any number of ways, right? Yes, um, in, in addition to the, the risk assessment and saving money. And if it's a rainy day and you're just bored, there are a lot of humorous patents that are in there. Not necessarily intentionally so. Uh, the some? Butt, the butt-kicking one. Some intentionally, yeah. You put in some search criteria and you, who knows what you might find. Um, so I, I want to note that professional searching is available, and by that I mean service providers, that that's what they do for a living. And it ranges from a person working in their basement or in the coffee shop with their phone, um, all the way up to uh, very relatively large um, uh, service providers with a lot of people and a lot of dedicated resources, internal training, and a lot of other things. So there's a, I've had people make comments, and I've also been a bit dubious about some of these entities that say, have you an invention? Share them with us. So, um, you know, there's yeah. always the, the red flag that they'll run off with your, your concept. And well, I don't think that's as much of a risk as they'll just run off with your money. Yeah, so um, how, do you, how do you parcel these, the good from the bad? Uh, you know, finding the good, I'm not so sure I have an answer for that. It, it's a very, what we're talking about is what in our industry thinks of as invention development entities, companies. Mm -hmm. And the idea is you've got an idea, but what do you need? You, you need patenting, maybe you need prototype assistance, maybe some market research, uh, find investors. It, you know, it sounds like if you could roll all that up into one thing and it's just one-stop shopping, I have an idea. Uh, and it seems reasonable, maybe you would pay something for that, but here's some money, here's my idea, and they turn it into a realized revenue stream of some kind. Th that, you know, as a, as a dream, uh, sounds awesome. There have been a number of companies that have taken a shot at that, um, and it's, it ranges from not so effective, although maybe well-intended, all the way to what appears to be just out and out, you know, a fraudulent activity. There's no one more um, sold on themselves than an entrepreneur with their idea. And you frankly need that belief in order to get past all the obstacles you're gonna face, all the naysayers, all the, everything. Um, so, but that same drive makes you often a, 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 you know, a real open easy subject, an easy target for somebody willing to manipulate that. With that in mind, um, the patent office was charged by Congress with, can you help at all in that space? And so the patent office is not a policing entity that tries to look for those things and, and go bust chops. But what they did do is at their website, uspto.gov, um, you can click your way through for inventor resources and they have uh, 
an area at their website where they try to allow conversations about these entities to be had. Uh, not exactly Yelp for in invention development outfits, but kind of, sort of. And to report on things like, well, does the um, FTC, uh, the, yeah, the Federal Trade Commission, are they looking into it? Is the Justice Department looking? Have they been a, charged with a crime by some attorney general somewhere? Are just users of the services really unhappy and why? So uh, I haven't looked at it for a long time. I, I hope I'm not overstating what you might find there. Uh, I'm probably not understating. Um, I might be overstating, sorry. Um, but that's one thing you can do. If you see an invention development outfit, in addition to the other kind of due diligence, which might be just the Better Business Bureau, you know, reviews such and such on Google, although be careful because people know how to spoof these days and you may find glowing reviews that are bogus. Um, but do look at the, at least the Patent Office website um, and if you can see somebody there that's getting, apparently they're at least not listed as bad, that's one thing. And if they might be listed as maybe, maybe helpful. That is the one resource I know of that's trying to at least be somewhat objective and controlled. One thing that I would like, if, if I was to ever engage with someone, an entity like that, would be to have any agreement looked at by an attorney. And I've, I've seen many agreements, in fact, I've used to craft them, uh, but that again comes back to one word or one sentence can screw you. And so if you do have any legal agreements with any entities like that, I really highly suggest you get an attorney to look at that. Yeah, you know, as an attorney, I'm going to say the unpopular thing of if you're going to sign something, you probably maybe want to have a lawyer read it unless you're really, really familiar with the territory and can recognize the anomalies. Um, in real life, that's hard to do, but you know, with click through and all the other, you know, things that we all sign every day without reading. Um, so, but yeah, uh, if you're gonna if you're gonna try to retain services of an entity like this, that's probably a really good idea. Yeah. So back with respect to searchers, uh, you're certainly looking for someone with experience in your technology. There can be, particularly with smaller shops, you know, where you're maybe one, two, three searchers, they may have five years experience or 30 years experience, but if they're chemical experts and yours is electrical, that's not such a great fit. They may say, oh, we can search anything, but still, it might be better to find, you know, someone that's speaking conversant and familiar with your general technology area. Qualifications of the searcher, um, you know, and this, that, that's not a guarantee of anything. You can find a PhD in something and they just don't do a good job for you. And, you know, some high schooler who's a genius and who's amazing on the internet and, and does a great job. So these are not be all end all, um, you know, litmus paper tests. But to me, it's relevant to understand, uh, you know, in general, what are your qualifications? Have you been doing this for a while? Uh, and so forth. And also, where are they going to search? Um, if they're just going to hop on Google, well, okay, uh, there are other databases, and then some are proprietary and some are not. We're going to be talking a lot today about non-proprietary because it's what you can do on your own. But if you're paying somebody, um, knowing that they may have access to some proprietary and what is it and how good is it and how deep is it, what does it cover, uh, is all relevant to understand. Um, I've got a couple recommendations. Uh, I don't get kickbacks from these people. Um, I do tend to go to these folks when clients ask me to have a prior art search done or a patentability search. Um, and the reason I like them is they're both you know, 100, 150 people, at least a uh, master's degree or above for many of them, a lot of experience. They have training, they keep up with searching techniques, um, they have access to deep and wide uh, data resources, some that are proprietary and some even within their four walls of themselves that they They've created themselves. noodle things yeah. up. The first one is it's CPA Global. It's really what you're looking for is Landon. That was the original search entity and then they got acquired by CPA Global, which is this bigger thing. Um, and uh, 
uh, great people to work with. You can kind of, I think, for about a thousand dollars budget, uh, you'll get a really good, in most cases, prior art search for um, across the board. Some technologies could be more, some less. Do they have a specific specialty though? No, you're talking about 150 people. Right. So I don't know what they couldn't okay. search. They probably have something where they'd go, sorry, we're not, okay. we're not there. Uh, and they will, they very much want to understand, they're very interactive with you. It's not throw it over the wall. You know, they'll come back to you and it's like, well, okay, we think this is what you want us to search for. And they'll even switch their mind that we were going to have this person search it. But now that we understand it better, we think this person would do a better mm -hmm. job. And I really like their deliverable. Um, it's not just a pile of references. Um, they give you a document that is relatively intuitive. The first time you see it, it's like any spreadsheetish thing with tabs. You're sort of like, what, a, what am I got here? But once you've gotten through it, it's pretty understandable. And it really helps you digest the information. Because you don't take at face value a conclusion they give you. You need to look at it and see what you think. But the deliverable they give you really helps you to do that. So the other one I've listed here, uh, Nordic, um, it's actually the Danish Patent Office moonlighting uh, as a search entity. So it's the Danish Patent Office at night or daytime, and maybe at night it becomes the Nordic search facility. Again, it's about, I think it's about 150 searchers more or less. Again, very skilled people, a deep access to a lot of good information. They communicate well back and forth. They tend to be uh, a bit more expensive, in my experience, than Landon. Um, and really, for that reason, I tend to go more to Landon, um, plus buy USA. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so what the product is that they give you, should they find that there seems to be some wiggle room to getting... Well, do, there... can, you, can you add that to your patent application or your provisional? Patent? Well, it... Um, what I'm revealing here are two entities that tend to be my go-tos for searching. There are others, uh, and nobody, by the way, will give you a guarantee. It's just that difficult to task. So nobody will guarantee the results of their search. And your experience could vary dramatically. Anybody is capable of, you know, in any given day, maybe not doing the best job compared to how they might have done it another day. So, so we'll be putting these two links into the descriptor for this uh, episode. So, uh, in terms of searching resources, and now we're talking about, for the viewer, uh, to do some searching yourself. These are uh, resources you have to do your own patent searching. So, we start with the U.S. Patent Office, uh, USPTO.gov. Um, it is a website unbelievably packed with content. Uh, not so long ago, they did a revamp of it to make it look and work better, and it certainly improved it. It is still a frustrating site. It's not intuitive. To find what you want. You know, like, I know things that are there, and if I've lost the link and I have to hunt and peck my way through it, it it's frustrating sometimes. But you can, at their site, uh, do online searching. As I mentioned, you can actually go to the patent office and search paper at the patent office. Um, so at, at the website, you can do searching online. There's a lot about it that I don't like. Um, and I'm not going to beat on it a lot because I'm going to get to what I do like. And when I explain everything I do like about it, just suffice to say, this resource doesn't do all of that. So Steve, what do we, what, if you go to these entities here, what do they expect you to turn up with? They, not, they don't want you to just call up and say, I have this idea, do, what, or do they? If you know them, I mean, I can, I've done that. <laughs> I, I call them and say, and they'll say, oh, yeah, but I, that should go to, to Fred because he'll be the better person to help you. Um, I've sent them an email and they'll get back to me. Um, I also am trying to be a, a good customer and I'll go to the website and they have a get a quote button to push and I can um, upload you know, like here's some inventor documents. Um, but so how you get to them is, a, and, and these guys are pretty much the same way. And so with, when, when you're uploading your concept, that's safe? I believe so. I mean, okay. they, they will, that's another thing about working with, you know, you pick someone to work with, is it safe or not? Um, there's 
yes, I say it's safe. You know, are they good for it? Well, or you not? can't make a guarantee on that, so we right. know that no guarantee warrants. But with these your folks, promise. yeah, I feel very confident right. you know, that their their business model would die in a moment if they if they were not right. preserving. But the that's, some, that's of that something content. that someone would ask. It, sure. And it's a good question to ask. I just am, yeah, I'm comfortable with these folks. So you can possibly call them up, say I have this concept, and then you sign up as a client. Yeah, yeah, they'll give you a quote. Yes. I mean, they'll both come back. Or you can say, I'd like to spend about this much. Um, and um, they'll both work with that. They'll let you have an idea of what you're going to get with that. Because that really is a question of, we're probably going to look here. For another $100, we'll look here. For another $100, we're going to look here, and so forth. I usually provide them some inventor materials because usually I've got some there's a flow chart or there's a picture or there's my elevator speech or there's my PowerPoint presentation explaining why this is great I usually have some of that but I usually have a one to four paragraph like word document or something I put in email that I have authored that is what I think is kind of the it's more than the elevator speech because I'm these are the it's the description and I'm hitting key points that I want to make sure that they look at when they search. And I almost always, if I know the inventor and the subject matter area well enough, I might not. But ordinarily, I write that. Go to the inventor. Here's what we're going to show the searcher. Are you good with this? And, and oh, yeah, we don't really care about that. Or these other two points ought to go into it. Um, you know, so that might get edited. So now the searcher has this kind of main mission. And then they've got this illustrative or clarifying or more detailed content that may or may not be helpful to them in doing the search. So someone who might be somewhat nervous about using either one or both of these entities, do you suggest that uh, using uh, applying <coughs> online, communicating online leaves a paper trail or a... I mean, whether you talk to them orally or not, it's going to get written down. But you can... Um, express a wish to talk to somebody that look it's kind of hard for me to write this down or whatever I, i'd like to I, maybe i can't look you in the eye but you know let's at least virtually do that um you know the, both of these entities would because i've had conversations with them where it's like yeah let's talk about this one um and and you can kind of bounce it back and forth the real point is do they understand what you want to be searched and they may in turn have ideas about where to search so they could actually help you clarify oh, yeah, and absolutely. articulate much more precisely what your that possibly patentable concept is. Absolutely. I mean, they're, they want to do a good job. And you know, they've learned if they've got a mushy description, it's, it's hit or miss if they give you something useful. Well, it makes their job difficult too. Well, right, because now I'm guessing. I have to make assumptions or, or guesses. I have to read between the lines. And it's better if they don't do that. So sometimes a conversation. Because you save money when the more articulate and precise you are. And probably generally speaking. Yeah. Although you can have a very crisp and precise statement that still is expensive to search because you're just wandering all over the map. It's a function of tonnage and time. Right. So the U.S. Patent Office can be searched. I, uh, other government patent offices, some to a lesser or greater extent, uh, have similar facilities. One of the best is at the European Patent Office. They have a system that gets a lot of other countries. So you can search at one place. So this is the EU one? Yes. Brexit is, is enough of an interesting thing. It may or may not have some impact on how Britain's involvement is going to play out. But um, certainly the patents that have been but, issued through the, this is still going to be and to the extent grandfathered the, and honoured. The European Patent Office allows you to search. Uh, yeah, to the extent, I don't see that would be any difference. You can continue to search Great Britain patents, I'm sure, just as you can search European patents. Um, it goes beyond just the European Patent Office in terms of what you can search. So Ooh. that's pretty good. Um, Google. Google actually has a, a little part of their world that's patent searching. And if you just put in a patent number, it may well return the patent. Um, but uh, it used to be Google slash patents, and then that would get you to a place where you could, you know, it would know that your searches were looking for patents. Um, again, it's, it's, 
okay. And a lot of a lot of people use that 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 come to me and want to talk about things. They've done a search. The odds are good they were either at Google Patents or at U.S. Patent Office, but Google Patents probably first. Um, now let's talk about what I like the most, and that's www.freepatentsonline.com. And this thing, in one guise or another, has a long history, uh, decades long, as a thing that's grown. And okay, we'll, we're going to talk more about this in a minute. We're going to okay. get into examples, but what makes them great, as far as I'm concerned, it's, it is free. It is U.S. issued patents. It is U.S. published patent applications. It is the European Patent Office records. It is Japanese abstracts in English. It is some German patent content. It is uh, WIPO, World Intellectual Property Organization stuff, which is the Patent Cooperation Treaty, which is basically where a huge number of foreign patents, when somebody in any country decides to go foreign, whether it's U.S. going foreign or somebody in Britain going foreign, many times it goes through the PCT pipeline. And those PCT documents are in this resource. And they even have some non-patent literature. It, it's not a very extensive library, but it comes along free for so the So that sounds like it's just it's, so this the one-stop one shop there. Huge, deep resource. Is it easy to use? Um, we're going to spend about half okay. this conversation on that. It's probably about an hour's worth of your time to get trained to really use it. It's very easy to use at a very superficial level, but to make great use of it takes a little more effort. We'll talk about who's that. Who's behind it? Um, I forget who's behind it. We're going to see their splash page. Right. Uh, whoever's behind it has a horrible idea of marketing because their splash page is just awful. Crowded with text. They offer many, many services, um, it, mostly patent related. Uh, and I'm not that familiar with those services. They may be great, they may not. I'm not here to recommend or not recommend. What I do like is the, this patent searching capability that they sponsor. My understanding is, in this going back in time, way back when, IBM, who's always been a huge recipient of, of a volume of patents, um, built a database that they could search so that they could understand for themselves, we've got this new idea, can we get a patent on it or not? And they built this database. And it got big enough that somebody had the idea of, why don't we open this to the world? Um, and then eventually, maybe to monetize it or for whatever other reason, it got sold or acquired or something. So it's not IBM anymore. But its genesis, I understand, goes way back to that. Mm. And then rolled forward and, and you know, is, is tied in with these other services and it may be the the free try this you'll like us and we have all these other services. It, it may have been one of the like first them. things that came out on the web on the internet. Um, don't know. Yeah. I know that it goes back to my days at Motorola when it was the IBM thing. And yeah. I forget what it was called at the time. But if that's even, if I've even got the story straight. But it's been around a long time one way or the other. So uh, if you're going to do your own searching uh, and you want to kind of dig into this, those Landon folks that I was talking about, they actually published this book called Patent Searching Tools and Techniques. So you can go with the old joke that, hey, they wrote the book on this. If you're the kind of person that may do this, you've you got a lot of ideas. If you're at once a month or once a week, this is probably a good resource to maybe just get your chops up on what is this all about. So let's talk about freepatentsonline.com. So this is, uh, this is a screenshot from actually some time ago. Oh, I just love these latest activities. I'd, I'd sign up for this just to get all the just latest news. Oh, and you can see this goes, these screenshots go back to 2014. So there, yeah. I, I haven't felt the need to update because what I care about is what you see right here. <laughs> right up at the top, you can put your search here, click enter, and you're searching the patent database. But if you click to the next where it says search, you get this little little menu showing expert search and quick search. You want to click expert search. Before we leave this screen again, today's version of it's going to look different. Mm -hmm. Probably has even more text. Uh, they have so many things that they offer. I, I invite you to feel free to wander through that. I, again, neither recommending nor not recommending. Um, uh, but they, they certainly have an awful lot of stuff going on at this site. 
So let's say you click expert search. Now you get to a screen like this. And uh, let me just, okay. So you can still enter a search here and just click enter. But now you've got this block where you can enter more stuff, if you will. You can see here, you can check a box and include everything, US patents, US patent applications, EP documents, abstracts of Japan, WIPO, German and non-patent literature. You can check, you know, for example, I only want to know about issued patents because I'm looking for something expired that I can use. Okay, you just check that box. You don't care about German or Japanese patents because who cares? Um, or you can just say, I'm only interested in the US. Check two boxes. If you're curious about prior art, it's can I get a patent on this? You check all the boxes. Over here, there's a couple of things you can do that's actually can help limit your search results in sort of general ways. So you can say forever, I, you know, just whatever, whenever it happened, or I know it would only be things in the last 20 years that matter. Um, if, you've, if you're searching blockchain, yeah, the last 20 years is going to be fine. And you'll skip an 1888 uh, patent for an ox thing that's got a block and a chain. chain. Um, Word stemming, I always leave it on, but there might be a reason why you would turn it off. And that's just, and you can click on that to find out, what do you mean by word stemming? Um, and then sort order, I always do it by relevancy. They, as you'll, they, they, they come up with a search, or your returns, and you'll get a score with 1,000 basically, or 999, meaning everything you want is in here. But they'll show you some things where it gets ishier, um, and you'll see that, oh, score 330. Maybe I don't even care. I'm not even going to look at those. So rather than chronological... Do um, the relevancy. Yeah, I typically do the relevancy. But you might have a reason for knowing the thing I'm looking for is it's, just in the last three years. It came from this guy and this company, and I don't. I only need... So chronological would be fine. You, ha you mentioned here that you, if you were looking for prior art, you'd click them all. So would prior art out of Germany or Japan affect someone's patent application in the United States. Absolutely. Published so, anywhere in the world. So that is something that we all need to be aware of. We, um, are you up for a slight diversion on prior yes, art? Yes, let's, let's go. All right. So prior art uh, at the United States Patent Office, and actually in most places, it's, has it, is it known to man? And if you can establish it and when it was known, then it's prior art. It doesn't even have to be real. It can just be paper. It can even be fanciful so long as it was in fact enableable. And there was a, um, a court decision that is just a great example of that. So the invention is a dairy barn and one of the problems with dairy barns is they have animals in them and animals drop things and you have to clean it. So this invention is a you've got your dairy barn floor and you've got a half trough on opposing sides, lying along the edge. You let water come in, fill up the trough, and suddenly it'll crest and a wave front will go across the floor of the dairy barn and then push everything into the other trough where it's then washed away. So ideally, you just turn on the water and turn it off and your barn floor is clean. So there was this patent application filed and people fussing over whether the prior art taught it or didn't it. And the court, on its own initiative, said, yeah, Tales of Hercules. One of his challenges was to go clean the, I think it's pronounced the Aegean stables. Mm -hmm. And Herc was a busy guy. He didn't have a lot of time. So he took his shovel and he dug a trench from the river Styx to the stable and a wavefront cleared the stable. Herc said, challenge, check the box, what's the next one? But he didn't use two troughs. No, but the basic idea of yes. a wave front across, yes. now you get into what are ways to accomplish that. Yes. Did that actually happen? No. No, but is the technology itself va valid? Sure, water source, direct it, dairy farm, floor, you know, a, a, mm -hmm. and, and sweep it across. And the court said, that's prior art and you combine it with a couple of other teachings, your invention's not new, or it's not, it's, it's, it's not patentable, given the prior art. So the answer to your question, long way of getting there, anything 
um, that is known to humankind in some instantiated way, not forgotten knowledge, is prior art. And this is the beautiful thing about having you here is that you bring stories and people learn best with stories. I do. <laughs> so that's, that's a great story. So uh, now I've said we've got the search space. Before you do your first searching, you look up here and it'll say, click here for syntax instructions, field abbreviations, and character map. I'm not so excited by the character map. But you ought to click syntax instructions. And there's a and reason. If you do, you're going to find part of what makes this so awesome. Again, we've got this very deep database, but now the way I can access it is pretty darn interesting. It's not just like a Google throw the words in and what do I get back. You can do that. But, for example, um, um, here we're talking about field abbreviations. So if you just put in a word, it's find any document with that word anywhere. But now one of the uh, fields you can do as a limitation is ABST, the abstract of the patent. If you think, if it's in the abstract, I care about it. If it's not, maybe it's not so relevant. So you put in that particular field denominator, slash, and then the word you're interested in, and it will only return documents with that word in the abstract. There's a lot of different fields. We'll talk about that in a minute. So I have a question here. Is a cat, if you use it as category or something, Sometimes. Yeah, yeah. So with would... word stemming, it will it 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 with no with no word stem with word stemming, it will cat category catatonic. It'll bring everything up that. Now has... they also have characters you can put in, so you could say yeah, I'll accept a little bit of this, but I only want one letter more. So cat or cats. So C A T and I think asterisk. So that'll get me that, but it won't get you category. So normally in a search, it used to be that if you put an ast. Uh, Asterix, it would bring up anything. That yeah, I, I may not have the yeah. that character right, but there's characters you can yes, use. Yeah. To, you can either just let it go any number. So, so it can differentiate it if, yeah. if you know the. Right. The if you if you do. if you know, I really want cat or cats, but I don't want category or whatever. There's a way you can control that. Thank you for watching the video. I know that you're excited and following these people. Hit like, hit subscribe, and hit the notification bell. And we look forward to hearing from you and seeing you in your journey too.